Thank you all very much for your attendance and you're very welcome this afternoon um, to this presentation by our very uh, distinguished um, speaker who has come to us just this morning across the Atlantic um, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing what he has to say. Just before we begin, um, just the normal uh, announcements. If you have a mobile phone with you, you don't have to abandon it, but if you might just switch it to um, silent, that would be helpful. Um, and, but if you feel like tweeting, you can certainly do that. And obviously you know that you can do that uh, with your phone still on silent. Um, we're going to begin just now. We'll, the event will uh, be about an hour. Um, so um, our speaker will make his contribution for 20, 25 minutes and then we'll have an opportunity for some interaction and questions uh, from yourselves. Um, as is our convention here, the address itself is on the record, the initial address. Um, but we uh, apply Chatham House rules and conventions to the Q&A um, and that's our practice here so um, uh, you might just bear that in mind when we come to that session. And we'd like as well when you do ask a question, if you'd like to ask a question, just tell us who you are and any organisation that you represent here. So as I say, you're all um, extremely welcome. Professor David Keith. Um, is um, uh, led or leads or led to the development of Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program. He's professor at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and at the Harvard Kennedy School. And he's also, um, interestingly, founder of Carbon Engineering, which is a Canadian company uh, developing technology to capture CO2 from ambient air. Um, he's going to talk to us. Um, for, as I said, for 20, 20, 25 minutes on solar geoengineering, public policy, and geopolitical considerations. So, will you please welcome David Keith. Thank you. This is great. I'm really happy to have. I mean, even even during my talk, I'm happy to get interruptions, and, and I look forward to a, a good back and forth afterwards. Um, maybe I'll start with just like five minutes of sort of my take on where we are in the climate policy now. So I actually did go to the climate uh, uh, march this morning in Dublin or at, at noon, which was exciting, really exciting. And I mean, truly exciting. I've been involved in climate for about 30 years, basically. It's been my full-time work for probably since 1990 or so. And, and I think we won't get real political action without the sort of politics of people market, marching on the street, I think. And it, it's exciting to see it. Um, it's not the only exciting thing. I think, um, you know, over the last decade, the biggest surprise to me and the biggest real excitement has been the extraordinary drop in the cost of solar power. Wind power, too, but less in important uh, from my perspective in the long run. Um, and, and I just can't get over how uh, amazing it is. Um, it's always refreshing when you're just clearly wrong, it, like wakes you up and makes you think why. I, I, for another talk, I looked this up. I, uh, among other things, I published in 208, a paper that was a careful expert judgment survey of a bunch of um, people in the PV industry, 30 kind of industry leaders in the, in the photovoltaic industry. And um, the conclusion of that paper was that there was at best a 50-50 chance of getting module prices to 30 cents a watt by 2030. And we concluded generally that it was just not really, you know, that solar was overhyped and it would be really hard to see getting um, cheap solar, you know, before 2040. So, you know, you just, we could not have been more wrong. In reality, module prices will likely be, uh, uh, the module price indexes will be 30 cents next year. So, so it's just stunning. And, you know, you go look around, I was just looking, in, in pre pre preparing for another talk, uh, I, I found a, a particular solar site in North India that's a 2.25 gigawatt solar site that was constructed at an all out cost of less than $600 uh, uh, dollars per kW. It's just stunning. That's a world that we really didn't expect, and it truly is a different world with different possibilities. Very exciting. Um, yet, as you know, emissions are still up. That is, emissions are still going up. And as presumably you all know, and, but it's easy to forget, to solve the climate problem, to stop the climate problem getting worse, you have to bring emissions to zero. But even when we do bring emissions to zero, even when we have this day of global celebrations and whatever it's going to be, 2050 or 2070, when net emissions are zero, that doesn't solve the problem in any meaningful way. It just means the problem isn't getting worse. In that sense, it's deeply different from air pollution. You know, air pollution is still, by many measures, the, the, the 
largest sort of large-scale environmental problem, killing a few million people a year globally. But the lifetime of air pollutants in the atmosphere is a week. So when you, when you restrict the pollution, the problem goes away basically instantly. Yet the um, lifetime measured in terms of the climate impact of, 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 of carbon to climate, you can think of as infinite in terms of human politics. So more or less, as, you, as presumably you all know, temperature change or climate risk is proportional to cumulative emissions, period. And that means when you bring emissions to zero, you haven't made the problem better, you haven't solved the problem, you've just stopped making it worse. As presumably you all know, while there's a lot of talk about the idea that there's uh, 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 thresholds at 1.5 degrees or something like that, these are political targets, which I think are in many ways well-intentioned and thoughtful, but I think it's fair to say that there's no deep scientific evidence that there are sharp thresholds. It's clear that the warmer it gets, the more risky it gets. It's clear that's true in a nonlinear way. So it's uh, uh, much worse to make it two degrees warmer than this to make it one degree warmer. But there's no sharp threshold. And the idea that there's some safe level is pure political fiction. Nobody in the elite climate science world believes it. It's simply cumulative risk, and risk goes up with cumulative emissions in some nonlinear way. That's the reality of the problem we're dealing with. And, and Emissions are still going up. We need to bring emissions down and bring them down to zero. But even when we've done that, all we've done is stop making the problem worse. That's really deeply different from many other environmental problems we deal with. Just the last couple words about the, the, the policy situation. I think there's this very interesting moment now. I think it really is exciting. I think there's a sense of more attention to climate and to this topic I'll tell you about solar geoengineering than there was over the last decades. And yet at the same time, or maybe because of it, there is um, a much less prospect for strong, formal international agreements. So, so we do have the UN framework on climate change, but given the reality of the world today, with the rise of populism, with more authoritarian, authoritarian governments in some of the biggest countries, there doesn't seem to be an immediate prospect for strong global agreements. But that, in fact, may be linked to the rise of this kind of bottom-up activism that may actually drive action. Because the fact is, the global agreements we have weren't really driving emissions down in countries anyway. Mm -hmm. they, they were, they were uh, framework agreements, but they weren't being translated agreements that really were driving emissions down. Mm -hmm. And I think to do that, you need some level of political force, country by country, which forces governments to do it. And I think there, there feels to me like there's more prospect for that now than I think there was a decade ago. So, what is solar geoengineering or solar radiation modification, which now seems to be the IPCC standard uh, name for it, or, or SRM we often call it? Um, it is, put simply, the idea that humans might deliberately alter <coughs> the reflectivity of the Earth to offset some of the risks of accumulated carbon dioxide. The most important disclaimer I can give you is that nothing I will tell you about this technology uh, uh, gets us out of the need to cut emissions. At the best, it is a supplement to cutting emissions, not a substitute for it. So I think that the, the complicated statement you can make is that a combination of emissions cuts and solar geoengineering might produce a, a, a safer world than emissions cuts alone, or maybe not. We don't know that for sure. But that's the strongest version of the statement you can make. So let me say a little bit more about what it is, how we could do this. Um, if you want to offset some of what uh, climate science calls the radiative forcing, the amount that humans are pushing the climate, uh, we measure the radiative forcing in watts per square meter. So we're now the long-lived greenhouse gases like uh, uh, CO2 and methane and SF6 and whatnot are now warming the climate with a warming force of several watts per square meter. So if we wanted to offset some of that by making the Earth more reflective, one way that could be done is to put aerosols in the stratosphere. Aerosols in this context just means tiny particles, a micron or so in size, which uh, will stay in the stratosphere for a year or so. The stratosphere naturally has aerosols in it, including sulfuric acid aerosols, so the idea would be to basically increase the concentration. The most obvious idea is to increase the concentration of those sulfuric acid aerosols to reflect away a little more sunlight. To give you a sense of how this would actually work, if you um, 
wanted to, say, cut the rate of warming in half starting in 2025 or something, one could uh, start adding with a, a, literally a small number, a handful of, of special class altitude aircraft, new sulfur to the stratosphere, and you'd start adding a little bit more each year so that maybe after a decade you were adding um, 100,000 tons a year or something like that. So that would be a kind of growth rate that would roughly cut the rate of warming in half. So wh what does it mean when you put sulfur in the stratosphere? You're, you're um, adding to the uh, amount of scattering aerosols, which are scattering a little more sunlight back to space, which is offsetting some of the radiative imbalance that's causing climate change, just by scattering some sunlight back. So the big questions that you, there's a whole bunch of governance questions you should have about this, but the technical questions I think really divide into two. One is, if one could produce a pretty uniform, that is spatially uniform, that is the North Pole versus the South Pole or whatever, if you could produce a pretty spatially uniform uh, reduction in radio forcing, that is increasing the, the reflectivity back to, the, back to space, if you could do that, how effective would it be in reducing climate risk we actually care about, in reducing sea level rise or peak temperatures or tropical cyclones or what have you? The other question is, could one produce a uniform radio forcing like that without having some awful big side effects? What would be the side effects of, of producing it? So th those are two of the sort of technical questions, and there's a whole bunch of, of, um, um, of questions about how on earth we would govern it, how we monitor, et cetera. Um, I, I do want to emphasize it's both kind of, I think, an ugly fact, but it's an important ugly fact that just the pure matter of doing it appears to be technically easy. It appears to be in the realm of lots of states, including small states, which brings up the, the potential for unilateral action. So uh, uh, lots of the ability to build aircraft that can fly to 20 kilometers is no longer a particularly hard thing. Hindustani Aerospace could do it, Embraer could do it, lots of, of contractors around the world could do it, it's not so hard. Um, and and uh, the number of aircraft you need even by the 2060s would be like 50 aircraft from one or two bases in the tropics. So it's just not hard to do. Total expense for the direct expense of doing it would be of order billions a year. That's the kind of ugly and frightening fact, allowing all sorts of potential for unilateral action. So that's the idea of stratospheric aerosols. There's a bunch of other ways one could do this, including potentially space-based technologies, including ways of altering high cirrus clouds, including uh, altering a certain kind of marine stratus clouds. There's a bunch of different ideas, but for now I'm gonna leave it at this idea of, of um, stratospheric aerosols. Um, so let me give you, well, let me step back actually. So why has this idea been such a taboo? Why has there been so little research? Why hasn't it gotten that seriously? I think the answer has been a, I think in many ways, sensible political fear that the very idea of solar geoengineering would be exploited by forces that wanted to block um, emissions cuts. Uh, and that this is often called a moral hazard, although it's not quite clear it really fits as a moral hazard but that it would be politically exploited by forces that wanted to block emissions cuts. And, and for that reason, the environmental forces that have been pushing for climate action have generally not wanted to support serious efforts to, to develop or understand these technologies. So that's kind of part of why we don't know very much. Um, nevertheless, over the last decade or so, there has been, while it's small, a fair bit of research done. So while this is still tiny compared to the global scale of climate science, which is itself tiny compared to the, the cost of cutting emissions, um, the, the research on solar geoengineering is not zero anymore. There's small, tiny research programs in India, Australia, China, Sweden, or Norway, significant Germany, there was a UK one, um, US, there, there, there's, there's quite a few, and there's, as I said, something like 500 papers written. Essentially, every major climate model has sort of formally been tested with this thing, including formal model and comparison projects, and it's been sort of formally built into some of the big assessments. So, so we know something. We know more than we did a decade ago. And some of the obvious questions about side effects have at least been looked at. It doesn't mean we know all the answers, 
it doesn't mean that we can confidently say it. It certainly doesn't mean we could make informed decisions about deployment today, in my opinion, but it means we know something. And I think part of the reason that this topic is more visible is actually simply the accumulation of knowledge and the fact that in many ways these ideas look better than they did before, in the sense that as we've looked, we found less risks than we thought, and the technologies actually look more effective in climate models than we thought. Who knows about reality than in climate models? Um, that really is, I think, a surprise. So I'll give you a little flavor of that, because I think it really is new and important, and then pretty quickly close and, and take questions. Um, so, maybe first on climate model response. So it, there was never any question that solar geoengineering could reduce global average temperatures. So if truly all you cared about was keeping the world under 1.5 degrees C, if that was really all you cared about, then the answer is solar geoengineering is perfect. It works without fail and you don't need to bother to cut emissions anytime soon. But of course, 1.5 C is a proxy for all the stuff people really care about, which are local impacts to ecosystems, uh, changes in water availability, changes in storms, changes in sea level, ocean acidification, a whole big range of things. So 1.5 is a proxy. Um, and, and the question is, how well solar geoengineering works, not at the global level, but how well it works regionally to reduce changes that people actually would care about. So on that, I think we, we truly are learning more. There's, there's some big model intercomparisons. I'll tell you about a study that we published in Nature Climate Change about half a year ago, but I think it's, it's an important illustration. So, so I'll give you some sense of the background. This isn't a technical talk, but, but personalities and motivations matter. So this study used one of the really best climate models from the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, um, which is one of the oldest climate modeling groups, actually the one that Suki Manabe originally wrote the climate models in the mid-60s for. And um, they had previously never worked on this topic, and we persuaded them to try this super high-resolution climate model for the first time ever on this topic. And this turns out to be a model that is one of the very few models that does a really impressive job on tropical cyclones. It's, it's really quite exciting. If I can be a climate model geek for a second. In the old days, we had little Fortran subroutines that kind of pretended to be tropical cyclones. And now with these modern models that have like a quarter degree resolution, you, you, the tropical cyclones emerge from the model physics and they look remarkably like real cyclones. Like they have the right distribution of, of uh, wind speeds and season of the year and so on. And so it really, you begin to believe these models have some skill in saying something meaningful about tropical cyclones, which, you know, for, 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 for the tropical world is a big fraction of all the, 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 the variability and a bunch of the damage from climate change. So we did that totally new set of investigators, this guy, Terry Emanuel, is one of the global experts on, on, on cyclones from MIT. We, we did a careful analysis looking region by region using some standard regions that the IPCC uses um, to look for each region, whether for different variables, I'll tell you the variables, whether um, solar geoengineering exacerbated, that is made worse, that is made farther from pre-industrial, or moderated, that is made closer to pre-industrial or better. Um, so we looked at not just temperature, which is obvious, but we looked at water availability. Uh, and, and what we found, like every other model, is you see this thing you probably all know, that the wet get wetter and the dry get drier. That's the sort of general fact we see from climate models. So what's interesting is solar geoengineering almost perfectly reduces that. So there was no region that was made that, where, where there was significant exacerbation uh, 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 of, of, of dryness. Um, for extreme precip, solar geoengineering is extraordinarily effective in reducing extreme precip. And there's some basic physics why that should be true. But again, we see strong reductions in extreme precip. This was the max five-day precip over a year, um, uh, basically everywhere. Temperature is easy, so temperature is reduced everywhere. Um, um, so extreme precip, extreme temperature, water availability, which is precipitation minus evaporation. Uh, those are the big ones we looked at. Tropical cyclones for sure. And, and that really is an extraordinary result. That's getting to be many of the key, what the IPCC calls climate hazards, the thing that, that drives human risks. And that means for many of these things, uh, on a region by region basis, solar geoengineering could at least in principle as simulated theoretically in a model, reduce these risks. And there was no region, none of the IPCC's so-called SREX regions, that was made worse off. That's really kind of a stunning result. The question I think at this point is, is it true? And I don't think we know. So I wouldn't make 
policy decisions on this basis yet. Right now, the group of us working on this is still quite small. Maybe we're inbred, maybe we're group thinking. So, so I think we need, at this point, I'm not advocating for doing solar geoengineering. I'm advocating for having a much larger international, serious mm. open access research program. And that's the decision we face, mm. is do we bring this thing out of the shadows and really look at it, mm. really research it, do experiments, make it sort of central to our understanding of climate science. That's the debate we're having. But I would say there's evidence from not just that particular model I told you about, which happens to be something I was involved in, but really every one of the major climate models. And I think the following is true. It's now 19 years since the first serious climate model was run for solar geoengineering. And a lot of the communities had a bias to look for problems, a bias this was a crazy idea. There's still senior colleagues I respect a lot, like say Susan Solomon at MIT, who just thinks we shouldn't be working on this and she hates it. And, and given that bias, and given that it's been 19 years, the fact that there are no papers that show that uniform solar geoengineering produces particularly bad results anywhere, if it's done at a moderate level, that if, it, if it's done as a supplement to cutting emissions on a substitute for, if it's done in combination with emissions cuts. Given that, I think there's reason to take it more seriously than once. We have begun to look at some of the risks. So there's a risk of it damaging the ozone hole, there's risk of adding to air pollution, there's risk of more scattered light, there's a series of risks. I'm happy to answer questions about those, but I'd say on each of them we at least have the beginnings of some real investigation. Um, so maybe in the last couple of minutes I want to say I've, I've talked mostly about solar geoengineering. Um, I, mean, I want to step back and say geoengineering is often used for two, I think, completely different things. Solar geoengineering and carbon removal. My view is they basically have nothing to do with each other. They are both things that we might do in response to climate change along with emissions cuts and adaptation. So to me, the, the high level of climate responses can be divided into mitigation or emissions cuts, um, uh, carbon removal, solar geoengineering, and adaptation. Um, and they're all things we might do about climate change, but um, carbon removal, excuse me, in many ways bears much more resemblance to emissions cuts, both technically and politically, than it does to solar geoengineering. So I think it's actually kind of unhelpful to lump it as geoengineering. There are some carbon removal technologies, and the one that in fact was first prominent, which was ocean iron fertilization, which basically doesn't work and has been forgotten, um, that make it look more like solar geoengineering. But in general, it really looks more like mitigation. Happy to answer questions about it, but it's a different animal. Um, I guess in closing, I'd say, I'm happy to answer technical questions, but many of the big questions are how we would develop a research program that was stable and that didn't weaken the case to cut emissions, and how we would ever move towards actually getting, being in a situation where we can make stable international decisions about deployment, if, the, if we get to that. And I don't know the answers. What I can say is at least there is more international dialogue about this in a way there wasn't before. So, for example, a gentleman called Janos Pastor, who was previously the chief advisor to Ban Ki-moon for climate, so the person in some sense most in the middle of the UN climate process. When Ban Ki-moon stepped down, Janos is now running an effort uh, called C2G, which is uh, the Carnegie Climate Governance, Climate Geoengineering Governance has changed its name, but it was a, a, a NGO devoted to getting dialogue about geoengineering governance globally. And, and that they've got access at near head of state level and have kind of been traveling around the world talking to people. And it at least has got more conversations to happen and it's moving it onto the agenda. Some of you may have seen that there was a formal agenda item and fight at the uh, UNEA, the United Nations Environment Assembly, about a motion to have a, a working group focused on geoengineering, that that motion failed, but it was an example of this topic beginning to get kind of traction in the formal international community. I'll stop there. I'm really looking forward to questions. Thank you very much.